Biology 1, third and fourth quarter review of concepts. In this podcast, we're going to review DNA to protein, evolution, plants, and animals. The central dogma. How do we move information from DNA to proteins? Remember, DNA is a nucleic acid, and it's an information-storing molecule, information stored in the sequence of adenines, guanines, cytosines, and thymines within that double helix. Every one of your cells has a complete set of the codes for making any protein that you need in your body. To make an extra copy of DNA for all the cells in your body, the process is called replication. Replication basically involves making an identical copy of DNA, one for each of the two new cells made by mitosis, or mitotic cell division. Now, replication only happens when the cell is about to divide. Prior to the cell division, you need an extra copy of that DNA, and that's when replication happens. However, during the cell's general life cycle, the cell is carrying out its normal everyday processes. And during the everyday processes carried out by the liver cells, skin cells, nerve cells, there are hundreds, thousands of proteins that need to be made to carry out chemical reactions, as well as different products that need to be made by the cell. So we have a general flow of information uh, within the cell. DNA is used to make something called messenger RNA, and messenger RNA is used to make proteins. Proteins like enzymes carry out life processes. The process of DNA making messenger RNA is called transcription, and the process of RNA being used to make proteins is called translation. You do have to know all three of these processes and what they do. And an easy way to remember translation is that there's two A's in that word. There's only one A in transcription. Transcription and translation sound very similar. One way I remember translation is making proteins is AA, amino acids, make up proteins. So that's one way you can try to remember proteins are made by translation. The other possibility is that there's only one A in transcription, two in translation. So transcription comes first for the one A. Translation comes second for the second A. So why make proteins? DNA has only the codes for making proteins, and proteins must be pretty important because we know DNA is fairly important. So let's talk about that. Without proteins like enzymes, enzymes are a type of protein, you can't break down your food, and you can't build up other molecules like ATP. We have enzymes for both of those things, and literally hundreds, thousands of different other chemical reactions that need to be coded for. Without proteins like antibodies, you're not going to be able to clump up those invading bacteria cells and virus cells effectively, and your immune system would be uh, dramatically compromised without the role of antibodies or defense proteins. Without proteins, you wouldn't be able to make much of the structural materials within your cells and outside the cells. For example, proteins called keratin uh, make up your hair and nails, which is a structural protein, it's a very tough protein. And the actin myosin proteins that make a muscle that slide past each other also wouldn't exist if you weren't able to do transcription and translation. Without protein channels, you wouldn't be able to move stuff into your cells, uh, selectively moving larger molecules like glucose, as well as uh, using active transport channels for things like sodium and potassium. And without proteins like hemoglobin, a carrier protein, you're not going to be able to move oxygen around in your blood very effectively. So proteins are a very big and important part of biology. And the process of making them is transcription and translation. This whole uh, idea of making proteins is called gene expression, or we use a gene, which is a sequence of DNA that codes for a protein. And remember, the DNA is held within a nucleus in our eukaryotic cells. In bacteria, the DNA would be just floating around in the cytoplasm. So here's a picture kind of showing how it works. And uh, let's use insulin as an example. Insulin, you may not know, is a protein. And that protein was made by transcription and translation. This could be one of the cells of your pancreas, one of the beta cells that produce insulin. So let's talk about that as like an example to help us try to understand. When the amount of sugar rises in your bloodstream, DNA is transcribed to make messenger RNA. After transcription of the DNA gene, which is the sequence of the A's, T's, G's, and C's, to make messenger RNA, the messenger RNA is processed by cutting off the uh, introns, which are non-coding regions, and then we put a little cap on the end. Then messenger RNA leaves the nucleus and hooks up to a ribosome. The ribosome reads the messenger RNA codons, the A's, U's, C's, and G's, to bring in the right amino acids. And then the amino acids are brought uh, together at the ribosome and strung together to make a chain of amino acids. This chain of amino acids will fold into a complex three-dimensional shape based on the order of amino acids that will give the protein its function. 
In the case of insulin, this thing will fold into the insulin protein, which will be released into the bloodstream, and the specific shape of the insulin protein will lock up to other protein channels on your cells and open them up, allowing glucose inside your cells so you can do cell respiration. Basically, how this is how this uh, stuff works. Whenever we need to make proteins, and your cells are constantly making proteins, the process is transcription, which happens in the nucleus, then translation, which happens in the cytoplasm. Remember, making the proteins is done by the organelle called the ribosome. And a gene is a sequence of DNA that codes for a protein. All right, here's uh, another picture, kind of showing more complicated uh, steps here. Um, if you remember, we have DNA being used as a template to make our messenger RNA. And on DNA, we have the different types of uh, nitrogenous bases, which are just basically chemicals of adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. The enzyme that puts together the messenger RNA is easy to remember enough. That's uh, called RNA polymerase, and that's going to make the RNA molecule. The RNA has introns and exons. We cut out the introns, fusing together the exons. The transcript leaves the nucleus, binds to a ribosome down over here. The ribosome is going to read the A's, C's, G's, and U's chemically to bring in the right transfer RNA. Here's a transfer RNA to bring in the correct amino acid. Then amino acids, represented by purple, strung together to make our protein. And that's essentially how it's done. When you make your hair, when your hair is grows, growing, that's the keratin protein being made. If you're sick, your white blood cells, your B cells, produce antibodies, which are chains of amino acids put together by messenger RNA, gotten in their codes from DNA. All those proteins in your body, actin and myosin for your muscles, all made the same way. All right, natural selection. There is a struggle for existence. No one gets a free lunch in nature. There is a uh, uh, competition for resources. And of course, there's more ability of offspring to reproduce than what the environment can support. Now, this is just kind of common sense if you think about it. If there's only enough food in the forest for, let's say, a thousand deer, and the deer are breeding and multiplying, what's eventually going to happen is you're going to have 10 deer, 20 deer, 30 deer. There's no limit to the potential reproductive capacity of any living thing. And when the deer exceed the amount of resources available, then there's a fierce struggle for existence for what's what little is available. So all organisms must compete for resources to survive. And if you think about it, in human societies, we've tried to avoid this struggle for resources by increasing our resource base, adding farms, and uh, making the acquisition of food and other things that we need much more easy. Other animals and plants and other organisms, they don't have that option. So struggle for survival. Not every uh, salmon makes it upstream to spawn. Occasionally they get selected for uh, the faster swimmers and the ones that can blend in, as well as the ones that um, just are able to avoid the, the things that like to eat it. Survival of the fittest. Some individuals have adaptations or survival traits which are beneficial in some way to help them survive in their environment. Or it might give them a reproductive advantage, for example, those peacock feathers. Uh, another way of saying that is natural selection. Natural selection and survival of the fittest are the same. Keep in mind this is not evolution. Evolution comes after natural selection. So individuals are selected. The ones that have the best survival traits survive and reproduce more often. Doesn't mean they're automatically going to survive, but just more often and more frequently so that over time the entire population has those traits. For example, you could have an eagle with really great vision, and an accident could happen to the eagle. There's no reason why that eagle has to survive to reproduce. But eagles with better vision are more likely to find prey and eat than ones with bad vision. And over time, you have a selection for better vision of predatory birds like eagles. We call this greater fitness, and it doesn't refer to any kind of physical um, strength. It refers to your ability to survive in the environment you live in. If you live in a hole in the ground as a mouse, that survival trait is being small. A small mouse is more fit than a big mouse if it helps them get away from predators. Here we have a pictorial example of natural selection. We have a mixed population of beetles. The birds are eating the ones that stick out, leaving the ones that blend in behind. 
In this case, the green beetles stick out more than the brown beetles. So we have some of the uh, green beetles being eaten more frequently than the brown beetles. The brown beetles are reproducing, passing on their traits via DNA to the next generation over and over and over again. And then over many generations, we have selection for the trait of blending in, in this case, the brown beetle. So the natural selection part is the individuals that are being selected are the ones that can blend into their background. The individuals that are not being selected are the ones that stick out and are being eaten by the birds. Now, after the entire population has the survival traits coded for by DNA, that part is called evolution. So the first part, selection, happens to individuals. Individuals are either selected or not selected for survival and reproduction. Then if the entire population has those survival traits or reproduction traits, that part is called evolution. So evolution is also called descent with modification. The reason why the inside of a fetal pig, a human, a blue whale, a chimp, a dog, all have the same basic structures is because we all have the same common ancestor at some time in our distant past. So even though we look a bit different from the other animals that we share this uh, earth with, uh, all mammals basically have the same template for a digestive system, a tube with an in-hole and an out-hole. And the modifications to that tube are the result from natural selection and then when the entire population has that trait, evolution. That's the reason why cows have an extra stomach. They had selection for an extra stomach, uh, basically a bulge in one of their uh, areas of their tube to hold symbiotic gut bacteria to break down cellulose, things that weren't selected for in us. However, since we're all using the same structures, essentially, it's just modifications of the basic body plan template. Each species has descended from other species over time and share a common descent through common ancestry with other species. And we are separated, however, by millions, if not tens to hundreds of millions of years. Here we have some examples of what's found in the fossil layers. Remember, we find fossils in sedimentary rock. And in many cases, but not all cases, we have selection for size in herbivore animals as a result of being preyed upon and having a survival advantage being bigger. All right, so you should know this. Natural selection, those better suited in an environment survive and reproduce more successfully. That's kind of interchangeable with survival of the fittest. And then evolution is the change in the inherited characteristics in a population over time. Evolution is what happens to the population. Natural selection is what happens to the individuals in the population. Natural selection happens first. Evolution happens second. So to sum it up, genes mutate. Remember, this is the source of all new traits in a population. If you want to get a color pattern on the fur of a predator that helps you blend into the environment, you should hope for a mutation that will cause a change to the DNA, which changes the proteins, which change the physical characteristics or phenotype of that, of that organism. Now, if you remember, most mutations are not good. Most mutations either have no effect or a negative effect on the organism. However, if it wasn't for mutations, there would be no new traits. Without new traits, we wouldn't have evolution. Without evolution, we'd all still be single-celled bacteria. So mutating genes are fairly important in order to possibly improve upon the inv individual's existing uh, genome or DNA. Then as a result of some uh, differences in a population as a result of mutations, some individuals have a better survival or reproductive advantage than others, and that's natural selection. Then if those traits get passed on through the entire population over time, that's the evolution part, and the entire population will have or most of the population will have the traits that are associated with that survival or beneficial gene. So how are species created? Well, the answer is isolation and adaptation. If a population becomes isolated from the source population, there's no longer any gene flow between the source population and the uh, split off population. Any new mutations will be selected for uh, and not passed on to the, uh, the populations that are separated by time. So if you have a population of birds trapped on an island and the selective pressure selects for, say, a, a color pattern that helps it blend into the environment, those genes that are selected for in the island population of birds aren't passed on to the source population that might be on the mainland or on the continent. And over time, those differences accumulated 
uh, until the point they can't interbreed anymore and they're considered two different species. The species definition basically is not being able to uh, interbreed and produce viable fertile offspring. All right, then we went to classification and how we group living things uh, according to your characteristics. The largest grouping that we have in the Linnaeus system is called a kingdom. Here we have an example, kingdom animalia. And as you can see, it's very inclusive. It includes a lot of different uh, organisms. All you have to be to be an animal is move at some point of your life, heterotroph, eukaryotic, no cell wall, and multicellular, which includes a lot of, a uh, lot of things on this planet. Now we have subgroupings uh, underneath kingdom animalia, and these subgroupings have different names. Phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. The most specific or the least inclusive grouping that we have in the Linnaeus system is the species. And at that point, um, the members are able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. A very close relationship is the genus level. So if you share the same genus with another organism, in this case the polar bear and grizzly bear, as well as black bears, all have the same genus, that means they're fairly closely related. So that's something to look for. The ursus infers a lot of very uh, close relationships and a fairly recent common ancestor. Remember the two-part name for a species is its genus, ursus, and its species, arctos. And we also have a way to help us remember these groupings. The phylum um, class order family makes up a word called peacock, and men should ever peacock when they go to the bathroom. Kingdom's fairly easy, genus and species are fairly easy. So take a look here. Uh, who shares more levels of classification with the, uh, the fox? The snake, coral snake, or the panda bear? Well, we have two levels of classification with the fox. One, two, and then we have one, two, three, four levels of classification in common with the uh, panda bear. Because there's more levels of classification in common with the panda bear than the, um, the snake, we consider them more closely related. So this is a way to kind of help organize this. Uh, we have the inner groups uh, embedded within the higher levels of classification. And we just kind of keep on grouping these things according to their characteristics. And eventually we can eliminate uh, different organisms based on different characteristics until we get down to the species uh, level. All right, so how do we show the uh, relationships between differently related organisms and some of their characteristics? It's called a cladogram, and this is part of your lens biology project. Um, the way to read a cladogram is the animals have an ancestry or a past that they evolved from. Anytime you see a branching point, that's a common ancestor to both those organisms. So turtles didn't evolve from leopards, leopards did not evolve from turtles, but somewhere back in time, probably over 100 million years ago, definitely over 100 million years ago, they had a uh, common ancestor that was neither a turtle or leopard. If you look further back in time, even something like a lancelet has a common ancestor with a leopard, but it's further back on this cladogram, representing further back in time. The other way that you read this is, what's more closely related to a turtle, a tuna or a lamprey? Let's look for the turtle and tuna common ancestor. Tuna here, turtle here. So here we have our common ancestor for turtle and tuna. And then for turtle and lampreys, the common ancestor is further back. So there is a more distant common ancestor between turtles and lampreys than between turtles and tuna, and turtles and tuna have more in common with each other. They have a more close relationship from an evolutionary sense. Now these are the things that are used to, deri um, to determine things like uh, relationships, and all these things are coded for by DNA. And the more DNA is changed over time, the more differences that accumulate, and that would indicate probably a more distant common ancestor. All right, then we went into how viruses work. Remember, viruses are very simple. It's basically just DNA or RNA covered by protein. The protein code is called a capsid, and um, they're not even considered alive. Remember, they don't uh, have organelles. They don't carry out any kind of internal, stable internal environment. Um, they don't respond to their environment. They can't reproduce outside the cell, but only inside the cell. So they're almost alive. They meet some of the characteristics of living things, but not enough to be considered alive. 
Remember, viruses get inside your cell and cause disease. And there's two parts to the virus life cycle. The lytic part of the virus life cycle is where it actively causes infection, invades your cells, takes it over, and basically uses up all the materials inside your cells to make more virus copies and then breaks open and the viruses are free to infect other cells. In the lysogenic part of the life cycle of a virus, the DNA of the virus is just uh, hiding within the DNA of the host organism. And when the host cell divides, the DNA for the virus divides, but it's not actively causing disease. This ends part one of your fourth quarter review for biology concepts.